So let me begin. I was hoping that, is, is Fernando Dufour in the house? Has he arrived yet? I ask that because I'm going to be mentioning a resident of Montreal, a Montrealer, I believe it was born here, who I have known for about 20 years and um, has, been, has been very helpful to me over the years. He's been very supportive. He's been a real friend. And uh, he will be here eventually, but he, he's not quite here yet. But let me show you a picture of him. This is Fernando Dufour. He has been working on periodic tables. He designs periodic tables, and he designs three-dimensional periodic tables. And he's been doing this for, you probably can't see the small writing here, but his first model was in 1945, 1954, 1982, 1990, 1998, and he's still doing this. So this is not his latest model. And from time to time in the talk, I'll be referring to him because he has what I believe, and I've, and I've put this in writing in several places, what I believe is the, is the finest example of a three-dimensional periodic system. My particular favorite is the one that he's hovering over right there. And I'll, I'll be saying why I think that's a, a, a really great three-dimensional periodic system. Um, I should also mention that a movie is being made of Fernando's life and work at the moment, and it's being made by Colin Lowe, who's a very well-known filmmaker here in Canada, and he is here in the audience with his charming wife, and their son, Ben Gedlow, is also here, and he's the man behind the camera. And we all got together and had a fine, fine dinner yesterday evening. So I would recommend that you check out this website if you haven't already, because you, you'll see some short films, some extracts from this film that's in, in production now about Fernando. Let me give you a quick overview of what I'm going to be doing tonight. First, I'm going to describe the scope and importance of the periodic table, its role in popular culture, the history of the elements and the history of the periodic table. The book I've written that was referred to very kindly by Richard is about the, the history and the philosophy of the periodic table, or the story and the significance of the periodic table. I'm going to look at the impact of modern physics on the periodic table. Physics claims to have explained, physicists claim to have explained the periodic system. And part of my work has been to examine have they really explained the periodic system, or if they have, to what extent have they explained the periodic system? It turns out it's not a yes-no question. It's yes and no. They have explained it, but it's, it's interesting to look at the details. And then I'm going to look quickly at some recent developments. And then hopefully we'll have some questions. I believe there are some microphones set up. And here is Fernando now. He has just come into the hall. So let me, if you don't mind, backtrack. Fernando, welcome. You made it. Very good. We have some places for you here. Monsieur. So I was saying he, he is your local hero who has been working on this for um, a long time. Now, the periodic table. Here's a version of it. This is the version one normally sees in chemistry lecture rooms, physics departments, many, many different places. And for those of you who are completely unfamiliar with the periodic table, let me just give you a, a quick version. The periodic table is essentially about arranging the elements in order of increasing atomic weights, starting with hydrogen, number one, helium, number two, and the remarkable thing is that when you arrange them sequentially, every now and then you get an apparent repetition of the elements. Right? And it's not an exact repetition, but it is a significant repetition. What I mean by that is if I start with hydrogen and I move through the elements, when I arrive at lithium, I have an element 
that bears many similarities with hydrogen. And then if I continue to move through the elements, I arrive eventually at sodium, which bears many significant similarities with hydrogen and lithium, and so on. The next repetition will be at potassium. The next one will be at rubidium. And similarly, for any column in the periodic table, the essence of the periodic table is that the elements that fall within a vertical column or group have similar chemical properties. That's, that's the bottom line here. These are groups. These are called periods. Now, whereas elements falling into one group have very similar properties, as we proceed across, there is quite a lot of variation in properties. Now, the periodic table has attracted a lot of attention from a lot of people. Um, let me just show you a few quotations of what, the, what sort of things people have said about it. And uh, bear m with me as I show you two or three quotations. This is not going to be all about quotations, but I just want to give you a sense of what other people have said. An as a famous astronomer, Shapley, the periodic table is probably the most compact and meaningful compilation of knowledge that man has yet devised. Its history is the story of man's great conquests in the microcosm. The great thing about the periodic table is that it bridges the gap between macroscopic properties of the elements, properties you can sense, and the microscopic domain which has been explored by chemists and by physicists the structure of the atom, and even the substructure. En français, la perception du canevas global dans lequel se situent tous les éléments chimiques ouvre la voie à une méthode d'enseignement extrêmement efficace. Les étudiants ne se sentent pas débordés par toutes sortes de fêtes disparates qu'ils se croient obligés de mémoriser comme tel sans y percevoir le concept unificateur. Or simply put, it provides for students a unifying principle. They don't have to learn the properties of all the individual elements. Once they know the properties of some elements and they use the periodic table, they can get the properties of the other elements. Let me skip this one. Let me go to one final one. C.P. Snow is famous for having described the two cultures, the culture of the humanities and the sciences. C.P. Snow said, on learning about the table for the first time, I saw a medley of haphazard facts fall into line and order. All the jumbles and recipes and hodgepodge of inorganic chemistry of my boyhood seemed to fit themselves into the scheme before my eyes. As though one were standing beside a jungle and it suddenly transformed itself into a Dutch garden. And this is an experience a lot of students of science have had. You're first exposed to the properties of the elements and you begin to think it's all confusing. And then when you see the periodic table, pretty much everything falls into line. It is the periodic table is the icon of chemistry, one of the most important icons in the whole of science. There's only one icon in science that's perhaps better known, and that is the solar system model of the atom. But physicists now tell us that that is incorrect. Right? The, the, uh, the electrons do not literally order, orbit around the nucleus. It's more of a wave mechanical description. The electron has dissolved into a, a cloud of electrons. I'll be coming back to that later. Among the sciences, it seems that chemistry is rather unique in having one simple chart that plays this role of uni a unifying principle. On the other hand, even though it belongs, or it was discovered by chemists, I shouldn't say it belongs to chemists, it, it was discovered by chemists, it has been appropriated, as we will see, by all sorts of other people, physicists, geologists, biologists, and even regular people seem to like the periodic table. It has become a cultural icon, not just a scientific icon. And no doubt you will have seen T-shirts, ties, coffee cups, all sorts of things with the periodic table um, on them. For example, it's been used in advertising. Volkswagen had an advertising campaign some time ago where they invented a new element 
150 terbonium. We haven't arrived there yet. The, the biggest element so far synthesized is this one, 118. Um, the American Chemical Society issues badges for any of the elements you care to request from them. This all started, by the way, with a campaign to uh, allow Seaborg, Glenn Seaborg, the Berkeley chemist who synthesized a number of elements. There was a question of giving him an element or naming an element after him. And certain people objected to this because there was a tradition that if a person is still alive, they cannot have a name, an element named after them. But people fought this, and the beginning of the campaign was people went around with badges with Seaborgium, SG, and now it's taken off and you can have any particular element you want. Artists have been inspired by the periodic table. Here is one artistic rendition which retains the symbols of the elements. This apparently is a door to a restaurant in London, or it was, it's now been sold off at Christie's uh, Sotheby's. Apologies to Christie's or, or Sotheby's. And here's another artistic rendition. Here are the noble gases. These are the most inert of the elements that actually fall in a column in the periodic table. This is a, sort of an artistic rendition of that. Um, this is another artistic periodic system, a Braille version. Here is a depiction of one particular element, gallium, named after France. Number 31 in the periodic table. He, um, here is the artist using symbols of some of the elements to spell out his own name. So artists have a lot of fun with this. Here is a, using the motif of the periodic table, but with works of art hanging in that format. And so on. Uh, here's another one with a sort of locker arrangement. Here is a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Mouse pad. A mouse pad with an oversized mouse. It's the periodic table once again. Now, this one has completely different symbols from the usual ones. This is a periodic table of experience. Psychologists have decided that it would be rather useful to use the periodic table to uh, summarize all sorts of conditions. Here's a more conventional periodic table dealing with samples of all the elements. You may well have seen this if you are a purveyor of periodic tables. Um, there have been two comprehensive books on the periodic table. One of them is completely out of date. It was written 1896, before the electron was even discovered. The second one is by Van Spronsen, a, a Dutchman, an excellent book. And I would like to think that eventually I could add my name to that, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I'm going to show you a few periodic tables fairly quickly. This is perhaps one of the first periodic tables. Mendeleev, the Russian chemist, um, the principal discoverer of the periodic system, devised this periodic table in 1871. You'll notice he's left some gaps where elements have yet to be discovered, but he didn't just leave the gaps, he predicted the atomic weights of these elements. And as we'll see in a moment, a number of these predictions came true. This is a periodic table by Crooks. This is the pretzel-shaped periodic table, where, as you can see, you've got a figure of eight shape. And the crossing point falls with the, the noble gases. This is a periodic table by a man called Soddy, who was one of the first people to explore isotopes. So they come in all shapes and sizes. This one in the trade is known as the Empire State periodic system. This is the clock face periodic system. A clock face is a rather obvious shape to use because a clock face displays periodicity. You know, you have the big number 12 and you go round and you come back to 12 again after a certain period, after a certain distance. That's essentially what the periodic table is doing. You have to make adjustments in the case of the elements because the period is not always the same. It's not just 12 or it's not just 8. It varies. The rocket ship periodic table, where the wings of the rocket ship uh, display the transition elements. And let me show you a few others quickly. The, um, this one is by an, an unpronounceable name, so I'll just call it the 
the parking structure periodic table, and the coat hanger periodic table, and another funny shaped one. Now here the transition elements are being shown as bulges off the, off the side of this clock-like uh, arrangement. And here you see the familiar groups, for instance, group four, carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, and lead. Group two, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, and so on. These are the transition elements. These are the inner transition elements. These elements, in most cases, have yet to be discovered. These would be the inner, inner transition elements. Here's a galaxy periodic system. Here is a uh, Christmas tree periodic system. The Mayan periodic chart. And this is... Now, a lot of people who have a particular interest have developed periodic system. This one is by the cement makers. And they feature the elements that are important to cement. Calcium, silicon, oxygen. And you can apparently make a little cube of this. So you have the cubic periodic table. Um, this is a sort of novelty item. Spain issued a postage stamp in the year 2007, which was the 100th anniversary of the death of Mendeleev. And in, on this postage stamp, you will see four missing spaces. These are four of the important predictions made by Mendeleev. Scandium, um, technetium, gallium, and germanium. And all these predictions came out right. The pyramidal periodic table, the left step periodic table, and this is Dufour's periodic table, or one of them. Where did Fernando end up, by the way? Here we go. Hi. Now, uh, let me pause on that for a moment and, and, and mention what, what is particularly nice about this periodic system. And to do that, I'll go back to the pyramidal table. You see, it's been known for a while that the similarity in the elements is, in a sense, twofold. For instance, the elements such as boron and aluminum are similar to gallium and indium and thallium, and eventually element 113, when its properties may or may not be examined. But in addition, there are some secondary similarities between those elements and elements like scandium and titanium and lanthanum and actinium. Now, to depict that on a two-dimensional periodic table, such as this one, you have to go in two directions. To depict that on Fernando's table, you can do it quite simply by taking a slice through this three-dimensional model. So there's an advantage to going three-dimensional because it picks up these additional periodicities in the way that the conventional 2D table does not. Here is another uh, novel periodic system. Uh, hydrogen has been stretched all the way from group one to reach all the way to helium. The elephant periodic table, the spherical periodic table. Here is a periodic table I proposed a few years ago, which has elements of symmetry in that the first two periods consist of eight and eight. I'll say a little bit more about this if I get there eventually. So let me just move to the second part. Now, let me backtrack and, and now tell you a bit about how all this emerged. And I'm going to start right at the beginning, that's to say with the Greek uh, philosophers and what they thought. The Greek philosophers invented two extremely important, imp well, they invented lo lots and lots of concepts, but in this context, they invented the idea of elements, they invented the idea of atoms. First, let me talk about elements. The Greeks believed there were four elements. There was fire, there was water, there was air, and there was earth. And there was a one-to-one -one association between these platonic solids and those four elements I named. And they had a sort of logic for this, that if you try and push these shapes resting on the ground, the most difficult one to shift is the cube. So that had to be air. I mean, had to be earth. The one that is the sharpest shape was associated with fire, namely this one. If you were to press these shapes against you, the one that would hurt the most would be this one. So that had to be fire. This is the one that flows the most. And so that, for them, had to be water and so on. 
A fifth platonic solid, this one, the dodecahedron, was discovered a little bit later, and so they decided there had to be five elements. The fifth element was called ether. Now, in addition to viewing the elements as what we normally think of as earth, fire, water, and air, the Greeks had an abstract view of the elements as the bearers of properties. They called them the metaphysical elements, and they had this sort of scheme where the, the four elements that I've named were the basis of everything around us. And for instance, things that had a dry nature were thought to comprise of a combination of fire and earth. I mention that because it's of historical importance, but I mention that because it's something I'm going to be coming back to, namely the dual nature of elements. Na elements as simple substances, what can actually be observed and have definite properties, and elements as abstract bearers of properties. Now, I'm going to spare you the 2,000 years of intervening history and jump straight to this famous table by Lavoisier. This is the first important table of simple substances. Simple substances meaning the elements in the sense that we can observe, that we can prepare, that we can isolate. In fact, Lavoisier's emphasis in the course of the chemical revolution was to say, let's forget about the elements as abstract metaphysical quantities and qualities, and let's concentrate on what can actually be measured. This was at a time of the scientific revolution happening in different fields, and the, the emphasis was very much on what can be observed, what is tangible, what can be seen. And it was an abandonment of the more esoteric metaphysical views. And it was extremely productive to take this new view. So for Lavoisier, the, um, the concentration, the emphasis was on elements as what he called simple substances. And here's a list that contains about 30 elements. Some of them we would no longer consider to be elements like lumière, light, chaleur, or calorique, as it, well, chaleur there. John Dalton, a Manchester school teacher at the beginning of the 1800s, revived the other important idea that the Greeks had introduced, namely atoms, the Greeks had not done very much with atoms. They certainly hadn't attempted to get quantitative about atoms. And John Dalton just did just that. Not only did he revive the idea that everything was made of atoms, but he set about trying to estimate the weights of atoms relative to each other. And he took it that hydrogen was the lightest of all the elements, gave it a weight of one. And here's a very, very early table in 1805. So for instance, oxygen appears as 5.5, it then became 8, and it now becomes 16, for those of you who are shocked by seeing 5.5 here for oxygen. Right, this is a very early version. Now, this is a German chemist, Wolfgang Dobereiner, who noticed a very interesting thing. Once these atomic weights were available, you could examine the atomic weights of various elements, and he discovered what are called triads of elements. Here is a triad. It consists of lithium, sodium, and potassium. And the remarkable thing is that in a group such as this of three elements, one of the elements, sodium in this case, is intermediate in its chemical reactivity if you consider all three of them. In other words, if you throw little pieces of sodium, lithium, and potassium into water, lithium hardly reacts, sodium reacts in an intermediate way, potassium reacts vigorously. Right? Intermediate chemical reactivity. In addition, the atomic weight of sodium is intermediate between the atomic weight of lithium and potassium. If you add this value, approximately 7, to this value, approximately 39, you get 46. You divide by 2, you get 23. Right, so this is the first hint of a numerical regularity that is somehow underlying the elements, connecting the elements together. It's the, the first important hint towards eventually discovering the periodic table. Um, this is a, a very much simplified periodic table in which are highlighted four of Dobereiner's triads, the one I just mentioned, and then in addition, calcium, strontium, and barium, and a few others. I won't linger on the details. So that was triads. Another very important and fruitful philosophical idea, essentially, was discovered by a Scottish physician, William Prout, working in London, 
Prout examined a list of atomic weights that was available at the time and noticed something fairly obvious. That if you look at this list, there's hydrogen with the lightest of all the elements, that many of these elements seem to have a weight that are an integral multiple of the weight of hydrogen. There are some exceptions. There's a 10.9 and an 11.7 and a 12.6, but a lot of them are whole number multiples. So Prout drew the obvious conclusion. Well, perhaps not so obvious, but he, his conclusion was all the elements are composites of hydrogen. They're made up of hydrogen. This is Prout's hypothesis. What then happened was that some supporters of Prout tried to find more evidence for this. Opponents of Prout tried to find evidence against this. The general outcome was that it made people measure atomic weights much more accurately. So whether or not Prout's hypothesis is correct is in a sense beside the point. It's a fruitful hypothesis. It's, it's a refutable hypothesis in Popperian terms, and that's really what, what we want. We don't mind so much if the theory turns out to be wrong. We just want a bold hypothesis which can be refuted. That's what, according to the philosopher Popper, is what science is all about. Now, interestingly, Proust's hypothesis was initially refuted. There were too many exceptions. There were too many weights that were not whole number multiples of hydrogen. But in an odd sort of twist of fate, there's been something of a return of Proust's hypothesis in a modified sense, because if we look at the number of protons in the elements, this is now jumping forward in time, we find that indeed all the elements are composites of hydrogen in the sense of having an integral number of protons. Hydrogen has one proton, uranium has 92, boron has five, and so on. Also, in an astrophysical sense, we believe that all the elements were formed from hydrogen and helium, uh, some of them in the Big Bang, some of them in the interior of stars, some of them in supernova. Um, going back to Dalton, Dalton had proposed these atomic weights. But then a few problems started to crop up for Dalton. For example, Gay, Lussac, and Humboldt discovered that when two volumes of hydrogen combine with one volume of oxygen, you produce two volumes of water vapor. It is tempting to try and write this equation for that reaction. Two hydrogen, one volume of oxygen, forms two volumes of water. Now, Dalton believed that water was OH. It turns out he was wrong. But even then, or even barring that issue, there's still a problem. One, it's not balanced. Two, if this is really true, it's hard to understand how this should even get off the ground because oxygen is supposed to be, we're supposed to be dealing with atoms of the elements here, according to Dalton. Atoms are indivisible by definition, so this shouldn't even work. This was solved by Avogadro, an Italian physicist, Volumi eguali di gas nelle stesse condizioni di temperatura e di pressione contengono lo stesso numero di molecole. The more important thing he did, in all the other thing he did, was to realize that gases consisted not of atoms. The majority of gases are diatomic molecules. So now we can rewrite that equation in the following fashion. 2H2 plus O2 equals 2H2O. So we still have the idea of two volumes of hydrogen reacting with one volume of oxygen to give two volumes of water vapor. But now we don't have the problem of having indivisible atoms. O2 is divisible. It's a diatomic molecule that can be split into two. Hydrogen is divisible. So it essentially solved that problem. It allowed people such as Canizzaro, the Sicilian physicist chemist, to refine atomic weights, to standardize the atomic weights, and this, with this further piece of knowledge, with these more standardized atomic weights, opened the door, essentially, for the discovery of the periodic system. And in fact, the periodic system was discovered by at least six individuals in different parts of the world, most of them not even being aware of the other's existence or discovery. Let me quickly take you through some of these. The first discovery of the periodic system, quite definitely, is by a Frenchman, Begayer de Chancourtois, an engineer who discovered, in fact, a three-dimensional periodic system. There is nothing new about three-dimensional periodic systems. The very first one was the three-dimensional. Let me show you a picture. This is a 
a helix inscribed around a metal cylinder. And the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic weight. And so they start with hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, and so on. Helium had not yet been discovered, by the way. And then if you look down a vertical column, you see the similarities that I alluded to earlier. Lithium, sodium, and potassium fall in one column, magnesium and calcium, uh, boron and aluminium, and so on. Right? So this is, this is the first uh, periodic table. A London chemist called Newlands also came up with a very respectable periodic system. Newlands got a little carried away because he described periodicity as the law of octaves, and he made an analogy with musical octaves. And it's a pity I don't have a piano here, because I could have demonstrated this, maybe. Uh, what would Oscar Peterson have said about no piano in them? Anyway. Um, here's, here's a periodic table by Newlands. Um, I won't linger on this, but just, just to say it, it is a perfectly good periodic system. Newlands didn't get much credit because he made the mistake, if you like, of, of drawing an analogy to music, and people essentially laughed at him. They thought it was a ridiculous suggestion, and somebody made the objection that he might as well arrange the elements alphabetically, that he might get a better arrangement in doing that, and his paper was not published in the proceedings of the, the Chemical Society. A Danish polymath. He was a, a linguist. He was a chemist. He was a poet. He came up with a very interesting and novel periodic system where you have these radiating spokes. And we can see here many of the familiar groups. The oxygen group, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium. The nitrogen group, nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, bismuth, and so on. In fact, this, and by the way, this is about five or six years before Mendeleev's famous table. Uh, there's one important detail in which this it was even ahead of Mendeleev. Mendeleev came five years later than this, but Mendeleev got this wrong. He did not group together copper, silver, and gold. So many of these people were ahead of the game, didn't get credit for various reasons. Um, William Odling, another chemist from London, who produced a periodic system. A German, Lothar Meyer, produced not only a periodic system, but this very um, suggestive chart. This is not only suggestive of periodicity, but it, it, periodicity sort of cries out at you. What it's showing is that if you plot atomic volumes against atomic weight, every now and then you get a peak. And the peak happens at the elements, the alkali metals. So lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. So there's a property that's periodic sharply and significantly periodic. And then if you were to care to look at the elements in the halogens, for instance, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and so on, occur one place before that element. So periodicity is, is quite strikingly demonstrated here. And I come to Mendeleev, the, the principal discovery, discoverer of the periodic system, a Russian chemist. Um, this is his early sketch of a table, which is then cleaned up. You can see here all his doodlings, his corrections, his changes of mind, and what have you. Here is a stamp that's been issued, that was issued by Russia in uh, 2009. It's a very recent stamp, uh, commemorating Mendeleev's discovery. Here's the table I showed you earlier, and as I mentioned earlier, Mendeleev left spaces for missing elements, elements that had not yet been discovered. Not only did he do that, he predicted their atomic weights. Not only atomic weights, but some of their properties. And the, it has generally been held that this is the reason why Mendeleev gets the majority of the credit for the discovery of the periodic system. And there's, of course, a lot of truth in that. For example, in the case of an element predicted in 1871, now Mendeleev, one of the gaps I showed you, Mendeleev called the element eka silicon. It's a Sanskrit prefix meaning one like silicon. So it's an element like silicon. He predicted he would have these properties. The element was discovered 15 years later, and here's what the element really is like. And you can see striking agreement between predictions and actual outcomes. Almost perfect agreement. There's one here, the boiling point of the tetrachloride, which has gone slightly astray. 
well, to the tune of 14 degrees. But really quite remarkable achievement to be able to, to tell the future, in a sense. Now, what, what I want to add to this usual story is that introduce you to maybe a different aspect of this story. This comes from philosophy of science. Philosophers of science have been engaged in a debate for some time now about the relative value of prediction, such as predicting a new element, which is, of course, extremely impressive, as opposed to retrodiction or accommodation, which means explaining something we already knew. Now, in a psychological sense, of course, prediction counts more. Right? Because it's as if the scientist is predicting the future. And if it comes out correctly, we're all impressed by that, and that scientist gets all the recognition. But which one really counts? And a number of historians and philosophers have analyzed this question in some detail, and surprisingly, perhaps, it turns out that accommodation counts just as much as prediction. Sometimes it even counts more. Let me give you an example quite far removed from chemistry. Einstein's general theory of relativity has two or three important tests. One of them is that Einstein predicted that a beam of light going past a massive body like the sun would be deflected very slightly. This is a genuine prediction. He predicted this sort of deflection. Now, he predicted a deflection of 1.75 seconds of arc. That's minute. When this was observed in 1919 by Eddington, the, the numbers came out reasonably favorably in that Eddington's two experiments were 1.98 and 1.61. So they cluster around that. This result was announced and Einstein became famous overnight. This made the front page of the New York Times among other many newspapers. Psychologically, this was impressive. But another thing that Einstein did was that he retrodicted or accommodated another important effect, which is the advance of the perihelion of Mercury, as many of the planets, not Mercury, but it, on Mercury it's particularly noticeable, as planets go around the sun in an elliptical shape, the perihelion, the place of nearest approach, precesses and advances very slowly over the centuries. It takes three million years for this to go all the way around. But anyway, the, now Newton's theory, which had stood for something like 200 years, was able to predict most of this precession or advance of the perihelion of Mercury, but not quite all of it. There was a missing uh, or sometimes known as excess precession. The modern accepted value for this little bit of extra precession that Newton's theory cannot account for is 43 seconds of arc, give or take a few um, seconds of arc, and Einstein predicted, or actually retrodicted, right, 42.9. In other words, from Einstein's theory, you can recover almost exactly that excess precession. Now, should this count as much as the genuine prediction? This is not a prediction. This data had been known for 180 or so years. Historians have looked into this and have come to the conclusion that, at least in this case, the retrodiction did count for more. For one thing, the data was more stable. The fact that it had been measured and measured and measured over again mean, meant that that data was more reliable than Eddington going out and making two observations on the bending of starlight. Of course, that's been repeated and confirmed, but in the case of uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity, it does appear as if accommodation or retrodiction did actually count for more, at least to the scientists, as to whether the theory should be accepted or not. Maybe not to the general public who only saw the dramatic prediction being fulfilled. Coming back to Mendeleev and chemistry, Mendeleev made a total of 18 predictions. It turns out that half of them, right, nine out of the 18, were never found, just never materialized. And that's not a very good success rate. That's 50-50, right? If this was an astrologer making these predictions, it would be considered maybe reasonable for an astrologer to get it right half the time. Or, or you might say, well, of course, that's astrology. What could you expect? Somehow, we allow 
Mendeleev the, uh, the error of getting it wrong in half of the instances, surely this casts some doubt on the idea of prediction being all important. If prediction were all that important, the fact that he got it wrong half the time should count against him. It didn't. He is lauded for the fact that he made all these predictions. What he didn't predict, what nobody predicted, was the existence of the so-called noble gases. Not just one, but five of them. They were discovered by Ramsey, among others, in London, University College of London, and the first to be discovered was the gas argon. It presented huge problems for the periodic system. It was one of the major challenges to the periodic system. There were people who thought that the periodic system had met its ultimate challenge and that it would have to be dismantled. Because this element had an atomic weight of 40. Nobody was able to fit it in anywhere. I'll show you why. Here's the periodic system of Mendeleev, for instance. 35.5 is chlorine. The next one is 39. The next one is 40. The next one is 44. What are you going to do with an element that crops up with an atomic weight of 40? There already is one at 40. Right? It turns out it was eventually accommodated between chlorine and potassium, even though it has a weight of 40. Right? That couldn't be anticipated. Let me just go back. It's one of the very few gases that's monoatomic, not diatomic, that presented problems. It's completely unreactive, right? So some people said, well, it doesn't even belong in the periodic table since it's, it lacks reactivity. The periodic table is all about chemical reactivity. There were doubts about whether it was a mixture or whether it was a, a pure element. Other noble gases, completely unpredicted, were also discovered. So now you had a really embarrassing situation of five elements and what to do with them. Mendeleev tried his best to accommodate them and failed. And eventually it was solved by Ramsey and Rayleigh. And what they did was, and I'm, now I'm presenting a modern periodic table, they created an entire group that fits perfectly along the right-hand edge. So they fit between the halogens and group one. What the problem had been with uh, the element neon was that the, it repre represents one of the few examples of something called a pair reversal. And if I have time, I'll get into pair reversals in a moment. What may have been Mendeleev's most important predict, um, contribution may not have been these dramatic predictions, however, but may have been to revisit that distinction that I mentioned right at the beginning that the Greeks had made two senses of the term element. Element as simple substance that can be isolated on one hand, element as an abstract entity that cannot be isolated but is the bearer of properties that is the fundamental thing about elements. Um, Mendeleev was a great believer in this distinction. In fact, he went as far as to say that this sense of element was more fundamental and that the periodic system, in fact, summarizes this sense of elements, not elements as simple substances. Now, we did start a bit late, didn't we? Can I, how much longer would you suggest I go on for? Five minutes. Five minutes? Maybe 10. Any advance on 10? Uh, OK, they probably had enough anyway. So. Now comes the impact of physics, right? What, at the beginning of the 20th century, physics made tremendous, tremendous discoveries. I show a stamp here of uh, Madame Curie, who was one of the pioneers of radioactivity. She didn't discover it, but she pioneered it. She discovered two elements along with her husband. There they are, discovering radium. Um, Rutherford. Montreal's own Rutherford. Of course, he was a New Zealander who then went to Cambridge and studied with Thomson. But he came to Montreal and he made some uh, momentous discoveries. He was here for nine years, by the way. Uh, during that time, he, be he became a fellow of the Royal Society. He was, was awarded the Nobel Prize one year after leaving Montreal for work that was essentially done here at, uh, at a little rival university down the street somewhere. And, um, here are the diagrams that Rutherford used when he gave his uh, Royal Society acceptance lecture. Um, here's another challenge to the periodic system. At about this time, people started discovering all sorts of byproducts from elements. 
It was as if the elements had suddenly multiplied. From having about 90 of them, all of a sudden you had 200 or so. What are you going to do with all these extra elements? Again, the one thinking was the periodic table has had it. We have to dismantle the periodic table. We have to find something else. The periodic table survived. I mean, the periodic table survives to this day, but it took some, some fancy footwork. This, of course, is a thing that all high school physics students learn. This was discovered by Rutherford here in Montreal, the fact that the dif distinction between alpha, beta, and gamma particles. A little later, uh, Rutherford also discovered a very, very important thing, the transmutation of elements, the possibility of taking one element and con converting it into something completely different. What the alchemists had been trying to do for centuries and that were ridiculed for trying to do, Rutherford actually achieved by taking alpha particles, colliding alpha particles uh, with nitrogen atoms and converting nitrogen atoms into a, an unusual isotope of oxygen, the very first transmutation. And this is the basis of all the transmutations that are done these days in synthesizing uh, super heavy elements. Essentially, to synthesize a super heavy element, you take an existing element, you bombard it with particles, and you get another element. You have a transmutation going on. Uh, Mosley discovered that the ordering principle for the periodic table should not be atomic weight, but atomic number, which subsequently became associated with the number of protons. And once you do that, you clear up these pair reversals that I mentioned briefly. And uh, since I'm out of short of time, not out of time yet. Um, Rutherford made the, this flippant remark about, he was, he was very proud of being a physicist and he considered all the other sciences to be rather inferior. And he said all science is either physics or stamp collecting. And he was also frequently saying that stamp collecting was, chemistry was a form of stamp collecting. In other words, mere classification. You'll notice I'm illustrating this talk with stamps. I, I think stamp collecting is fine. And, and, of course, he was given the Nobel Prize not for physics but for chemistry, which embarrassed him a little bit, having said all these bad things about chemists. Um, another physicist made the remark a little later that now physics is capable of eating chemistry with a spoon. Physics got so sort of encouraged by their discoveries that they began to think that all of chemistry could be explained by physics. Right, this is the, technically known as the reduction of chemistry. Now, to a large extent, chemistry can be explained by physics, but not fully. Not in the way that we imply to students when we teach them that the periodic table is all about electron shells. I mean, that is just a superficial reduction. And there's, there's a lot more to it, and if I had time, I would be able to go into that. Um, Thomson discovered the electron. And let me see. Uh, Lewis, a chemist, not using physics, but aware of the existence of the electron, started postulating that the electrons were clustered on the corners of cubes. Now, he was getting the idea from periodicity, because once you get to eight, you have another period. So it makes perfect sense. All that he had wrong was that it's not a cube, it's a, it's a sphere. Um, Soddy, the discoverer of isotopes, and a colleague of Rutherford's here in Montreal. Um, this, by the way, is Panet, who is the father of the advisor of Richard and myself. Um, he made an important contribution to the question of isotopes. When all these isotopes were discovered, I, I mentioned a moment ago, there was a question of what are you going to do with all these extra elements? You've suddenly got 100 new elements. Right. Well, you don't have to worry, because these new elements are not really elements. They're isotopes of existing elements. And the way that was rationalized by this man, Panet especially, was to say, again, to draw on the distinction between simple substance and basic substance, and to say that the thing that the periodic table is classifying is not the elements as they occur in practice as simple substances or isotopes, but it's classifying the elements as basic substances, this more esoteric abstract sense of element. Okay, so by making that mental switch, the periodic table survives pretty much intact. And because, of course, when we point to something like carbon on the periodic table, we're not pointing to diamond or graphite or Buckminster fullerene. We're pointing to carbon, right? the abstract sense of carbon. Similarly, we're not pointing to carbon 14, 13, or 12. We're pointing to carbon. So that concept is already in the periodic table. 
It's, it's, it's nothing new that's being imported into the periodic table. The periodic table classifies the elements as basic substances. Let me just show this on a, on a simple diagram. This is the idea that basic substance is the, is the more philosophical, fundamental sense of element. And this can um, manifest as the simple substance or as the combined element. So take sodium in sodium chloride. In sodium chloride, sodium is, pre is present as the combined element. In sodium, the pure element, it's present as the simple substance. What they have in common is that they both are sodium as the basic substance not having actual properties. Right? This gets over the problem of, of the fact that the property of sodium seems to have disappeared. The property of familiar sodium seems to have completely disappeared when you move to sodium chloride. Right? There's no silvery metallic stuff left in sodium chloride. What is the common thing that persists in the combined and the simple substance? It's the basic substance. So these fantastic tables one sees are in a sense incorrect because they do depict the element as a simple substance. Right? For instance, diamond is being used here to uh, depict carbon, right? and that's just one of the allotropes. It turns out that the French language takes care of this rather nicely because in the French language we do not, they do not, we do not use the same one simple word element to mean both things. Now, the confusion comes in English. The French will say l'élément est la partie commune à tous les corps qui la contiennent ou l'élément est ce qui est commun à un corps simple et à tous ses composés. So élément in French means the basic substance. The stuff that actually occurs is corps simple. So that gets over that entire issue. It's more a problem in the English language than it is in the French language. So here it is in French. This is a discoverer of quantum theory. I haven't said anything about quantum theory yet. I have about one minute to cover the whole of quantum theory. Um, Bohr introduced the quantum theory to the atom and, of course, was able to explain in broad terms, the periodic system, because now we could say the periodic table is what it is because of electronic configurations. And so, for instance, lithium and sodium and potassium are similar chemically because they have an analogy in having one outer shell electron. So lithium is 2,1, sodium is 8,2,1, and so on. And let me skip, let me skip. This is Pauli, who'd introduced the fourth quantum number. I have skipped the second and third quantum number in the interest of time. And uh, I shall skip that. And now, the filling of electron shells proceeds by something called the N plus L rule. All students of chemistry are familiar with this diagram. This N plus L rule has yet to be derived theoretically from quantum physics. So although physics explains the shells, the filling of the shells in, in a broad sense, there are some in very, very crucial aspects of the periodic system, namely the actual order of uh, filling of shells in order to get the periodicities as they appeared. This has not been deduced from first principles. So one can still claim that chemistry has not been reduced fully to physics. Heisenberg, his famous uncertainty principle, at which point the electron begins to dematerialize cannot be localized. This is further enhanced by Schrodinger's discovery, uh, or really his equation treating the electron as a wave when the electron evaporates. Instead of being a particle on, a, on an orbit, it's now simultaneously all over an orbital. And that version of quantum mechanics, in, it, in its implementation, required some work by this lesser known person, Douglas Hartree, in England, who developed the, the Hartree method. And I'm going to skip you this, and I'm going to skip this. Now, the point is you can now solve the Schrodinger equation for any atom to any desired level of accuracy, provided you're willing to put in the computational time. This is still not a derivation of the periodic system, because you have to do it for every atom one at a time. There is the hope that one day one might solve the periodic table 
once and for all, just like the game of checkers has now been solved. Solved, right? The game of chess has not been solved. The periodic table is still in the role of the game of chess. There is no one universal solution. There are attempts to do this. The Thomas Fermi method, if you put in the value of the atomic number, you get an approximate value for the energy, but this is an approximation. Just finishing with some recent developments, there has been yet another threat to the periodic system. This is from relativity theory. With these very heavy atoms that have been synthesized, the inner electrons are moving at such high velocities that relativity theory becomes important. The result of that is that those inner electrons get drawn in, the outer electrons escape a little bit, and so that can, in principle, change the chemistry of these atoms. And, in fact, some of the elements, like Rutherfordium number 104 and Dubnium 105, seem to indicate the end for the periodic table, because they did not behave. See, Rutherfordium should have behaved like hafnium, well, it didn't. On the little, little chemistry that was performed on them, they seemed to misbehave. And so people began to say, ah, here we go. Finally, the periodic table has met its match. Well, guess what? When we get to elements like borium, everything falls into place again. And again, I'm going to spare you the details. And, but just to tell you that if you look at the values of some chemical properties of the compounds of borium, uh, they f it falls perfectly in the group where it is supposed to fall. And let me, f and I'm really going to finish now. Uh, let me finish on one thing that I've done recently. This is a conventional periodic table. I mentioned triads much earlier. Triads are much better represented using atomic number. So, for instance, helium. Neon and argon form a perfect triad. If you add 2 to 18 divided by 2, you get 10. Right? Hydrogen does not seem to fall in a triad. Given that triads are fundam rather fundamental, perhaps one could make a change to the periodic table in order to make hydrogen part of a triad. And that change is not very drastic. Its name was only approved a couple of months ago. And um, now, this element had been known for a while. It hadn't been given an official name, but it had been known for a while, and they'd even done some chemistry on it. And once again, the early ideas were that this might not fit into the correct group, but further work has shown that it does behave precisely as it should do according to the periodic system. I thank you very much for your patience, and I look forward to some questions. <laughs> <laughs>